This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Stick around to find out more. We are the first peoples of the Americas. We have been here from the beginning. Our ancestors navigated by the wind and stars, crossing vast oceans and mountain ranges, searching for new lands. Over thousands of years, our ancestors became astronomers and architects, philosophers and scientists, artists and inventors. We created distinct societies and built vast trade systems that covered two continents. In 1492, our world was changed forever, but we did not disappear. Today, the languages and teachings of our ancestors remain. And these are the untold stories of the Americas before Columbus. The architectural styles of our ancestors reflected the diverse natural environments of the Americas and the social and cultural needs of each nation. Ice houses in the Arctic, adobe apartment buildings in the Southwest, and hide teepees on the plains are unique designs that have endured for thousands of years our architectural accomplishments are not limited to houses. Throughout the Americas, large cities featured temples, central plazas, markets, and ball courts. Over the millennia, indigenous architecture adapted to changes in the environment, innovations in technology, and a growing population. Indigenous people have lived in southwestern North America for more than 12,000 years. Early Pueblo people lived in underground pit houses constructed from wood and mud. With the natural insulation of the earth, these houses were cool in the summer and warm in the winter. Around 2,000 years ago, the ancestral Pueblo began to cultivate maize, beans, and squash. Farming led to a more settled way of life and eventually to the growth of villages and towns. Here in the Southwest, this uh, tradition, if you will, of communal building uh, was very well developed. So that community sense, that community spirit, certainly was the essential way you survived. It was through the community and through participation in community work. <laughs> Architecture changed dramatically as the Pueblo people began to construct rectangular attached family houses above ground. 1,200 years ago, multi-storied apartment buildings began appearing across the Southwest. These adobe structures were built under rock overhangs and on mesas, and were home to hundreds and even thousands of people. Pueblo cities like those at Mesa Verde in Colorado and Chaco Canyon in New Mexico were among the largest ancient cities in North America. History Hit is like Netflix, just for history fans. With exclusive history documentaries covering some of the most famous people and events in history, just for you. 
from uncovering ancient Neolithic cultures to the dawn of the space race. History Hit has hundreds of exclusive documentaries with unrivaled access to the world's best historians. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a 14-day free trial and Timeline fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code TIMELINE at checkout. You see the height of the building of the apartment structures, especially really beginning during the times, I think, of the large cities uh, in Mesa Verde and Chalky Canyon. Those are definitely uh, structures that required an understanding of geometry, an understanding of practical engineering skills figuring things out in terms of, you know, load-bearing walls, how you can actually place one structure on top of another structure without it caving in. Those are, are technical feats, which have some central architects, you know, that are guiding the way the, the structure should be built. But the knowledge of how to do that is actually held collectively because everyone participated, you see in building these structures. The individual is like one strand of a much larger web of relationship. And so that community sense, that community spirit, uh, certainly was responsible for uh, what would be today called magnificent feats of uh, architecture and planning. For about 400 years, these large urban centers thrived. But change was in store for the people living in these cities. We know that there was climate change, you know, that affected and impacted the people. Issues like uh, a major drought in the 1200s that uh, catalyzed a lot of movement of communities out of those large structures. Uh, again, water being the, the central factor here in the Southwest, you know, you, you have to move to where the water sources are. A 50-year drought in the Southwest that started about 900 years ago inevitably led to crop failures. The people of Mesa Verde and the Chaco Canyon faced famine, lack of water, and most likely social upheaval. They had no alternative but to abandon their cities and search for new places to live. Some people moved south and established new towns along rivers like the Rio Grande. Others joined smaller Pueblo communities in different parts of the Southwest. With new people moving into these towns, the demand for housing increased. Migration out of the major cities did not mean that Pueblo society disappeared. It simply changed. Pueblo communities uh, today are, are really coalitions of large family lineages that have come together you know, to form that Pueblo. And, and that goes all the way back to to ancestral times, you know, in, in the sense that uh, it, it's really the extended family, which then forms into an, a, what is called a clan. And then the clans come together to, you know, almost through a confederation, create a uh, particular Pueblo. <laughs> I want to know what to do. 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 I want to know
Omt oi pelk oi ino tu bahu. It oi goyo ino iwam. Ino oi klo ino iwam. The people who built Chaco Canyon and Mesa Verde were the same people that you see today among the Pueblo people. This was not a this was not a dispossession of one group of people over another. Realizing that it was time to set a foot uh, on a new journey. Hello, I am here, man. You are here, man. One and I am here, I am here, I am here, I man. Oh, what the good, I am here, 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 People were able to come together in a variety of different kinds of communal ways to do community work. The physical building of community was an integral part of indigenous life. Multi-story apartment buildings and towering pyramids were not the only architectural accomplishments of indigenous peoples. About a thousand years ago, a vast road system connected millions of people in South America. Originally constructed by the Wadi society, this ancient highway was expanded by the Inca. It is the roads of the ancient Peruvians, uh, of those who came before the Inca, uh, who began building road segments that extended you know, the ability uh, for communities uh, to send troops, uh, trade, uh, engage in ritual and ceremonial activities. All along the Andes, you had these systems that the Inca built upon. One of the things about the Inca empire, and it truly was an empire, they extended these throughout the span of the Andes. The Inca designed their highway system to connect the people living in the four regions of their empire. The 40,000 kilometer Great Inca Road connected hundreds of cities and villages through a wide range of ecosystems and terrains. These roads extend all the way from Ecuador, all the way down into Argentina. Their empire extended in length some 2,000 miles from north to south. The Inca road was essential for the transportation of goods and information, as well as the movement of armies. What the Inca had devised was a system whereby they could supply armies or communities from a distance. In order to maintain their over 24,000 miles of roads, they used pre-existing road systems, and then they taxed people to maintain their portion of the road system. This grew in tandem with uh, conquest and population growth. Everybody was involved in the maintenance and construction of these road systems. The engineers who designed the Inca road were faced with a range of natural obstacles, including steep mountains, rivers, deserts, and wide gorges. We are looking at a region that is highly mountainous, very fractured, part of what we call the neovolcanic axis. How then do you connect road segments when you have you know, chasms and gorges? And Well, they built suspension bridges, and these two are marvels for their day. These ultimately became the models for the kinds of suspension bridges we here use today in modern society. They were able to span entire gorges, build durable rope bridges, sometimes extending all the way to the top of mountains in the region, uh, some 16,000 feet in elevation. They could run a road right through the desert uh, with shifting sands, and they did this by virtue of building low walls on each side that allowed for those to bank away the sand and allow the road to remain clear. This is a, a massive system. Besides being an impressive feat of engineering, the Great Inca Road served the political, social, and economic needs of the Inca rulers. This vast highway system was instrumental in creating one of the largest empires in the world before 1491. In every part of the ancient world, the efficient movement of people, food, and trade goods from one place to another was crucial to survival. Some road systems were impressive engineering feats that covered vast distances. 
Built over more than 2,000 years, the Great Wall of China was designed to prevent foreign invasion and protect lucrative trade routes. This 22,000 kilometer long wall also served as a major transportation route through ancient Asia. During the 700-year reign of the Roman Republic and Empire, more than 80,000 kilometers of stone-paved highways were built throughout Europe. Without this vast road system, the Romans would not have succeeded in conquering and controlling most of Europe and the Mediterranean basin. The Inca road system consisted of two north-south roads that followed the spine of the Andes. Today, parts of the road are still in use, including the trail that leads to Machu Picchu. The Chinese, Inca, and Romans built vast transportation systems. These architectural marvels allowed them to conquer cultures by controlling the movement of armies, food, and trade goods throughout their empires. Long before the Inca Empire rose to power in South America, the people of the Norte Chico region in northern Peru designed and built one of the earliest known urban centers in the Americas. Carbon dating has confirmed that buildings in the region, including those in the city of Caral, are at least 5,500 years old. Todo el Perú, toda América estaba habitada pero es en el área norte central del Perú donde se forma esta civilización con un desarrollo precoz. The city of Caral was the most prominent of the 20 or more cities in the Norte Chico region. It featured pyramids, sunken circular plazas, platform mounds, and residential neighborhoods. porque tenemos 150 fechados radiocarbónicos que sustentan la antigüedad comparable con las civilizaciones del viejo mundo. Podría decirles que hemos identificado en este valle de Supi a lo largo de 50 kilómetros 25 centros poblados. The buildings in the region were built on a foundation of quarried stone and river rock, transported in reed bags to the construction sites. O sea, se nota que entonces ha habido pues autoridades organizadoras de las actividades de la población que residía en estos centros. Hasta en el más pequeño no le falta un edificio público y una plaza circular hundida que tiene mucha relación con la, el sistema social de, de esta civilización. The Norte Chico region is prone to earthquakes and the engineers of the day designed buildings that could withstand seismic activity. Y estos edificios piramidales tienen tecnologías sismo resistentes. Innovative design techniques were used to prevent buildings and walls from collapsing during an earthquake. A grass called shikra was woven into a mesh bag, then filled with stones and used to form the retaining walls and foundations of buildings. The construction of short wall sections prevented major damage during an earthquake. Que también dicen que es un principio eh, antisísmico. The accomplishments of this ancient society that existed more than 5,000 years ago reflects a society that had superior engineering skills, an advanced social and cultural structure, and a strong sense of community pride. In the high Arctic region of North America, indigenous people had to adapt to the extreme weather conditions that existed most of the year. High tents were used for summer homes, and in the winter, whale bones, sod, hides, and snow were the building materials commonly used for housing. The engineering, you know, that goes into an igloo, it's built in a dome shape, of course, but that's not the most amazing thing. The entrance way down low traps heat inside the igloo. Because heat rises, you sleep about halfway up the dome, and that's, uh, you know, one of the warmest places. Snow houses, or igloos, 
were used for both hunting expeditions and as semi-permanent winter homes. Sleeping areas and storage spaces were placed near the wall, and the central area was a communal space for cooking and daytime activities. When you build an igloo, you test the snow to make sure it's, it's even all the way down, because where the layers are, the blocks will break. Usually you find a place with snow on a slant. You start at the top of the slope and trim your blocks like into a wedge shape. You trim your block so that it goes up in a spiral until you get to the top and you lean them in, you know, so you make a nice dome. You stick the last piece up through the hole and you trim it uh, so that it fits right in the hole and you just let it drop and then you're done. If you build your igloo that way, it will not fall down. You can actually climb up on top and it won't fall down. It would be nice, you know, if somebody could find the original igloo. But of course, you know, snow melts every spring and... <laughs> the extreme weather conditions and scarcity of building materials in the Arctic region led the Inuit people and their ancestors to develop innovative housing designs that were used for thousands of years. The construction of pyramids in Peru Egypt and Iraq at around the same time in human history suggests that peoples throughout the world independently developed the concept of building massive architectural structures. The Giza pyramids were built from limestone blocks that weighed from 2 to 15 tons each. The Giza complex included three large and three small pyramids that were tombs for the pharaoh and his wives. The ziggurat of Ur was a massive step pyramid that measured 64 meters in length and close to 30 meters in height. All that remains today is the foundation. It's believed that the pyramid was part of a temple complex and a shrine to the moon god Nana. The main pyramid in Corral measures 150 meters long and 28 meters high. It was made from hundreds of thousands of reed bags filled with quarried stones that were carried by laborers to the construction site. The ingenuity and engineering skills of ancient peoples can still be seen in the pyramid structures that have survived to this day. 600 years ago, the Aztec civilization was at the peak of its dominance in central Mexico. Founded in 1345, Tenochtitlan was the capital city of the Aztec world and home to close to 200,000 people. It was not only the political and spiritual center of the Aztec empire, it was one of the most impressive technical achievements in the world. So we have to go back to this geography of central Mexico 4,000 meters or 5,000 meters in elevation. In between all these volcanic ranges, a gigantic lake collecting all the water melting from the glaciers of these uh, volcanic edifices. And this lake doesn't have an outlet. So basically, this lake is going to be growing and growing and growing and growing uh, because there is no river that is going to empty this lake. One of the big achievements of the Aztecs is going to be the modification of tiny silt islands into a gigantic artificial island of 13 square kilometers and an unknown volume of cubic meters of dirt that had to be brought from the shores of the lake artificially to create that massive island. At the center of this man-made island, was the sacred precinct of the Aztecs. There is a big plaza. The palace of Moctezuma is on one side. The palace of the father of Moctezuma is on the other side. And then you see the main temple and the sacred precinct. 
the entire cathedral of Mexico City would fit inside the volume of the main temple. And that's only one structure in the sacred precinct of the Aztecs. We know that this area had more than 80 specialized temples. So from this center, you are going to have four causeways. One is going to be the Iztapalapa one to the south. The other one is going to be the Tacuba Street that is going to connect to the western shore of the lake. And then there's going to be another causeway to the north that is going to connect the center of that part with the twin city of Tenochtitlan, and that's Tlatelolco. We don't have to pay attention to the pyramids. The pyramids were small elements. It's the volume of building an artificial city in an island. Outside of the sacred precinct was a vibrant city where residents traded and bartered in a large central marketplace for flowers, fabric, jade, spices, chocolate, and everyday goods. Along the side streets were workshops where artisans specialized in metal, jade, and fabrics. But constructing an island from scratch and designing and building a city on top of it was only the beginning. There had to be infrastructure built to grow food for Tenochtitlan's large population. And then began to play with the levels of the lake. They had to create a system of dikes to basically regulate the flow of water in the lake, prevent the brackish water to enter the area, and also delay the movement of the fresh water that is coming down from the rivers in the mountains. So the, the dikes basically change the ecology of, of the lake completely. These dikes, levees, and causeways divided the waters around Tenochtitlan into large freshwater ponds, some of which were used for fish farms. Along the shallow lake beds, crops were grown in man-made fields called chinampas. But if, even if you are not cultivating for producing food, you are cultivating to create these magnificent gardens, beautiful gardens. Then when we have that context, we have to go back to the first Europeans arriving to this and climbing this pass between the volcanoes. And then at, at one point, when they are in this high point, for the first time, they look at the lake. They see these 40 cities around the, the lake, and in the middle of the lake, one gigantic island. An island that is artificial. We need to be reaffirming this. That island is not natural. That island is completely man-made. It's the product of the Aztec Empire. Seeing the architectural deeds of the Aztecs, they said, this is another Venice. Tenochtitlan, basically, that was the comparison. It's like, this is another Venice. Tenochtitlan was not only the ceremonial, economic, and political heart of the Aztec Empire, it was among the most impressive engineering feats in the world. The Incas had a larger empire than the Aztecs. The Aztecs had a more dynamic demographic empire, and Tenochtitlan became the largest city, indigenous city, ever created by the indigenous people. In Northwest North America, the abundance of red cedar made it a natural choice for a building material. The trunks of these massive trees were used to build structures called big houses that were used for both residences and community ceremonies. The diverse nations of the Northwest Coast lived in villages that consisted of several big houses. Some of the larger communities were made up of 30 or more houses and had populations of more than a thousand people. Building a big house involved weeks of preparation, with several families working together to construct the house. Different clans, different families would help each other out. And through kind of ancient engineering, they were able to move these and be able to maneuver them into place. 
It took a village really to, to be able to move the pieces for the house posts. Pre-contact era, some of those house posts would have been, you know, 500 or 1,000 years old. Uh, very ancient cedars. Even more so, the beams that go across from house post to house post were huge. Several related families shared a big house. Each family had its own cooking fire and sleeping area. The bedrooms were often made out of planks or mats. And each section of the big house, there'd be a number of different fire pits. Uh, we'd open up uh, smoke holes in the roof uh, for the smoke to escape. But when we wanted to hold a winter ceremonial, we'd clear out all of the bedrooms out of the big house and we would light one central fire. And for us, when we light a fire in our ceremonies, it's a way to connect to our ancestors. It's like a conduit right to the spirit world through the smoke that, that rises up through the smoke hole. So we, we light one fire in the big house and invite other tribes to um, come inside of that big house and, and to witness our dances and listen to the songs that belong to that family or clan. Inside of a big house, in our territory, we usually have uh, four house posts and all four of those house posts are carved and they relate generally to the origin story of the family that lives in that big house. And that's the purpose of our house post is to remind us of, of where we come from. When you'd wake up in the morning, you'd look up at your, your house post and, and realize that, you know, where you come from. And where you come from means so much to us. It's literally the structure you're living in. If you can imagine being able to look, look at your origin and realize that your whole ancestry is, is holding up your house. The cedar beams and posts that form the frames of the big houses were permanent, but the wall planks could be removed and transported to summer village sites. For our people, planks were very important possessions. There was methods in order to take planks off of living trees and still have the tree survive. So today you can find culturally modified trees that have had planks removed in, in even pre-contact time. The temperate climate and abundance of food in the Pacific Northwest led to the establishment of many permanent village sites. As a result, the big house was the primary housing structure in the region for thousands of years. Today, big houses are still used for potlatches and other ceremonies by indigenous communities throughout the Pacific Northwest. Between 900 and 1700 years ago, Tewanaku was the dominant society in a region that included parts of Bolivia, Peru, and Chile. Its far-reaching influence is thought to have been based on religion, trade, and culture. Tewanaku, the empire's main city, was built on the southern shores of Lake Titicaca. The seven-tiered pyramid, called Acapana, dominated the city's skyline. The city also featured impressive works of monolithic art. Tiwanaku featured running water, sewers, and painted walls. The buildings were made from massive red sandstone blocks that originated in a quarry 10 kilometers away. One theory is that the stones were transported on reed boats across Lake Titicaca. You have this massive lake system, Lake Titicaca, and this was a system that was, uh, uh, was an incredible resource for the populations of that region. And through time, the populations grew. As Tiwanaku expanded, so did its influence. The city center was organized to the cardinal points. Its temples, palaces, observatories, and pyramids had both religious and astrological functions. It was a place where people were prompted, and I believe by virtue of the ancestors, that spread its influence and set the basis for the, the principal cult of the Andes, where mountains were sacred and sacrifice was key.
Among the most imposing structures in the city is a solid 10-ton block of andesite called the Gate of the Sun. These massive gates, the tenant heads, the, the moats around the city, the waterborne causeways, uh, the, uh, the various structures like, like the Calahuasa, uh, all of these were structures that clearly are devoted to ceremonial uh, edification of the elites. So the elites in this ancient city clearly stood apart from the commoners in the city. About 1,000 years ago, Tiwanaku had evolved into a large urban center with a regional population in the hundreds of thousands. At the same time, further to the north in Peru, the Wari civilization was expanding its power base through military conquest. And Wadi, as it grew, was a juggernaut. It engaged in conquest and conflict interaction, and we have a lot of evidence for it uh, in the archaeology of the Andean region and along the coastal margins where they dominated. So you have these two juggernauts of civilization, both of them expanding into imperial status. They were no longer kingdoms. In order to assert themselves and to build their places of prominence and their sacred civic enclosures, they began carving massive blocks of stone, like the Gateway of the Sun, with what some have identified as the Staff God, or Viracocha to others, this deity that kind of was an overlord, a creator being. While there is no evidence the Wadi ever conquered Tiwanaku, they were the two major civilizations of their time. For thousands of years, ancient peoples carved massive stone sculptures and transported them across vast distances. The engineering expertise, tool technology, and artistic skills came together to create these impressive public monuments. Stonehenge is made up of a hundred stone monuments placed in a circular pattern. Stonehenge is made up of sandstone slabs transported from nearby quarries and bluestone slabs from Wales, a distance of more than 200 kilometers. Easter Island was settled by Polynesian mariners around a thousand years ago. Over the course of several hundred years, 900 statues were carved in a stone quarry and transported to different parts of the island. The tallest statue is 10 meters high and weighs 82 tons. The Gate of the Sun is a solid stone monument constructed by the ancient Tewanaku peoples. Carvings on the stone depict human faces, condor heads, and a central staffed man. It remains a mystery how ancient peoples quarried, transported, and erected stone monuments that weighed up to 100 tons. The indigenous large game hunters of North America faced one significant challenge above all others. Elk, buffalo, and caribou migrate constantly in search of food. To survive, hunters and their families had to follow the migration of these animals, sometimes hundreds of kilometers every year, across the central plains or the subarctic regions. This nomadic lifestyle created a dilemma. If housing was permanent, it couldn't be packed up and taken with them each time the herds moved on. But if it was too lightweight, it wouldn't protect them from the cold winters on the plains. The solution was the teepee. The word teepees uh, would be considered a southern word. Uh, that's from the Dakota language, which is a teepee, which means a gathering place for people. The teepee is a conical structure made up of multiple poles covered by animal hide or birch bark. These portable houses were relatively easy to put up, take down, 
and transport from one encampment to the next. The earliest forms of teepees were made from tree bark with wood frames. The teepee would have been more like a sweat lodge in its uh, very ancient origins, which could be as far back as 10,000 years ago. So it would have been a small bent wood frame, uh, and it wouldn't have had a, a fire in it traditionally. They would have used rocks uh, to heat it and done the cooking outside. That would have been mostly bark uh, covering, and uh, those benders would have been willow, black spruce, possibly uh, younger lodgepole pine as well. Over time, the Ojibwe, Cree, and other woodland peoples moved into the plains where bark was scarce. Eventually, the bark was replaced with the more accessible and durable hides of larger game. The shape of the teepee was also altered to accommodate the central fire within the structure. As time went on and as uh, people expanded and trade routes opened up some more, Following the buffalo was also probably the most important development of the teepee because you would have had to have been able to move camp very quickly throughout the summer months. And so it would have uh, made a economical sense to have something that you could take down very quickly and set up very quickly following the buffalo along their routes. In the Great Plains area, everything east of the Rockies, uh, teepees were always faced the, to the door to the east because of the prevailing winds. Uh, as well, it was also the first light of the sun that would make you warm. In historic times, the teepee was the primary possession of the woman. And it was almost exclusively the women's responsibility to pack up the teepee and properly put it together for transportation. Women were primarily the manufacturers of the hide and the builders of the teepees. There's no definitive evidence for dating. Um, there are many remains. Um, there's uh, uh, big horn medicine wheels, which are the most famous of them, and uh, they, they show that there was very large teepees, if that's in fact what they were for. There's other suggestions that these, these were not uh, teepees like we know them for living, but they were teepees for astronomical observation. And so they, they would set up the rocks around the teepees uh, in a very particular manner. There's also evidences in Alberta, Saskatchewan, Montana, of many large encampments. The evidence is being the rocks that were used to stabilize the, the teepee poles, I think as far back as between 4,500 and 5,000 years ago. Despite being portable and lightweight, the teepee could withstand inclement weather and constant handling through setup and teardown. It is a very remarkable structure. First of all, as a circle goes, that is always one of the strongest structures uh, there is to build with. This is shown time and again in, throughout the world with uh, other similar structures that are using the circle as well. So uh, in the case of storms, in the case of uh, uh, any sort of inclement uh, environment or weather, the circle is the strongest. As far as teepee goes and architecture, its uh, portability is remarkable. Um, it's incredible to, to see how fast a home is made with a few poles and, and a cover. Um, I mean, a lot of people say, well, it's just a tent, and it's not just a tent. This is a possibly technology that is thousands and thousands of years old, and it hasn't been advanced on. It doesn't need to be. It's perfect the way it is. Some of the earliest houses invented by ancient peoples were portable tents. They brought together all the elements of a small house with the added convenience of being light enough to take down quickly. The yurt is associated with nomadic, horse-riding Mongolian tribes who lived on the steppes of Central Asia. These portable homes are made from an expanding circular wood frame and covered with animal skins or felt made from sheep's wool. A yurt can be dismantled and rebuilt in a few hours. The 
The ancient peoples of Northern Africa have used portable tents for thousands of years. A family would have a smaller tent, while a tribal leader would have a more impressive dwelling measuring 20 meters or more long. The teepee was the primary housing style for people living on the plains of North America for more than 5,000 years. In the center of the teepee was a hearth with an opening in the roof to allow for the smoke to escape. The functionality of the Arabian tent, yurt and teepee were so advanced that they are still in use today. Ancient architecture is a window into the cultural worlds that existed in the Americas before 1491. From the tundra of the high Arctic, to the slopes of the Andean mountains, to the jungles of Central America, indigenous people created unique housing from ice, wood, stone, adobe, and hides. The villages and cities they designed and built were powerful expressions of the innovative spirit of our ancestors.